four o'clock now on your Monday afternoon and just in the last few minutes, a major update in the case of that woman who was hit by a train while detained inside of a police vehicle. The district attorney just announcing charges against her and two officers. Investigative reporter Jeremy Hohola has been following this case since the crash happened in September. Jeremy. Yeah, this is pretty significant, Tom and Ken. We already reported the attorney for the woman who was hit by the train was expecting this felony charge against her. That's stemming from a road rage allegation before the collision. The officers who arrested her are also facing charges for what they did before the collision. You'll remember this happened in September. Police pulled over a 20 year old woman named Yareni Rios Gonzalez. A man called 911 on her, claiming she pointed a gun at him during a road rage incident. As police pulled her over, one of them, Platteville police officer Pablo Vasquez, parked right on the train tracks. Another responding officer with Fort Lupton Police, Jordan Steinke, placed her in the police cruiser parked on the tracks. According to an announcement from the Weld County DA, Steinke has been hit with two felonies. That's criminal attempt to commit manslaughter and second degree assault. As for the cop who parked on the tracks, Vasquez is not facing any felonies, but four misdemeanors for reckless endangerment and parking where prohibited. Yareni Rios Gonzalez has been charged with one felony count of menacing. She plans to fight her criminal case. In the meantime, as we've reported, she's already taken the steps to sue police for her injuries. She continues to recover at home with numerous broken bones. And in the meantime, also as well, the DA would not make any more comments aside from today's, today's announcement because of the pending charges. Significant development. It is a big development, but just the tip. The tip of what we're going to learn in the ne coming weeks and months, Jeremy. Yeah, because there's a cell, you know, there's a civil case in the horizon, and now with this criminal case, we'll see what happens to the two officers in court. All right, thank you. We also have the story of an arrest stemming from the Halloween Day arson that killed a mother and daughter in Lakewood. Lakewood police say that they have arrested two juveniles. Last night, the fire at the Tiffany Square Apartments early Halloween morning killed Kathleen Payton and her 10 year old daughter. The fire displaced people living in 32 units. The two young people face charges of first degree arson and first degree murder. Police have not said how old they are and they're not sharing their names since they are younger than 18. A four decade old double murder in Breckenridge, but it finally had a closing chapter today. The man now convicted of murdering 21 year old Annette Snee and 29 year old Bobby Joe Ho Oberhauser back in 1982 learned that he will die in prison. The two women were shot to death hours apart on the same night. Prosecutors say they'd been hitchhiking home from Breckenridge when Alan Phillips picked them up, shot them and killed them and then dumped their bodies. The case remained unsolved until February of last year when prosecutors say DNA evidence linked Phillips to the murders. In court today, prosecutors read a statement from Oberholzer's husband. I pray that the lives he has so terribly affected can find their own personal solace and closure. May we forever cherish in our hearts the precious memories of our lost loved ones. Alan Phillips chose not to speak in court today. His lawyer said he continues to maintain his innocence and that he plans to appeal. Survivors of the Marshall Fire have a whole lot on their plate. Between rebuilding plans and permits, there is now a new deadline approaching. Yeah, many of the insurance plans only cover one year of living expenses for people who lost their homes. That means money to pay rent in temporary apartments could be running out at the same time that survivors are marking one year since the fire. Well, 9 News reporter Cole Sullivan's been looking into it in ways that the state is trying to help. And they say this doesn't just apply to folks who lost their homes in the Marshall Fire. The state wants all of us to take a closer look at our insurance policies. They say this fire was a wake up call about potential insurance shortcomings if something terrible happens and we can't live at home. Three letters Marshall Fire survivors and the rest of us probably never knew to think about. A-L-E, short for additional living expenses. It's designed to take care of the expenses uh, when someone is uh, put out of their home due to something like a, a fire. Vincent Plymel and the other folks at the state's Division of Insurance know about A-L-E. They say Marshall Fire survivors need to know too because they may not have it much longer. Because people uh, will have uh, ALE benefits in their homeowner's insurance uh, typically for 12 months or 24 months. 
uh, 12 is the more common. Most insurance policies provide 12 months of living expenses for costs like new clothes, storage, and rent if your home is destroyed. With the one-year mark since the Marshall Fire on the horizon, the coverage could soon sunset for survivors who still need it. It's very important for people to, to look for avenues on, to, to get these uh, extended if, if possible. If the insurance company won't play ball, he says try contacting the state for help. We can't require a company to automatically uh, extend their ALE benefits, but if, uh, if people feel there has been a delay, we can dig into that and investigate it. He says and the Marshall Fire served as a wake-up call for all of us to think about ALE before we need it and maybe take the option to pay more for longer coverage. It's something that people should um, really consider now. Um, you know, it may not be right for some, but it's something worth considering. Talking to fire survivors, in some cases, this coverage is the only way they can stay afloat. It pays their rent while they're waiting for permits to come through and for contractors to get supplies to rebuild. The state says most people only have one year of coverage in their policies, and they didn't think they needed that extra year when they gave that option. And they're just now getting permits. Right. And there's already this big delay of rebuilding anything right now. So it could be two years, could be three years. It could be more. And so we'll probably be having this conversation next year when really you get up against that two-year mark and the insurance company says that's it. As far as all the money that was raised for all of these people uh, following the, the Marshall Fire, is any of that available in some extent for some of these owners? Yeah, some of that money is going to some of these urgent needs. There was a pot set aside for that urgent need aspect of it too. And slowly but surely some of that rebuilding money is just now starting to reach those homeowners. I wish them the best. Thanks, Cole. Absolutely. Let's take a look outside. This is a picture of Loveland, Loveland ski area. One of them open. They're more opening this week, Tom. They all got a good dose of snow as of late, but Kathy, it's really always about that magical temperature and yep. like how they make snow with the real stuff and all that. And Mother Nature will be helping out. Kim, we're tracking a pretty impressive storm coming in from the Pacific. You might have noticed the wind outside today. Sure. Yep. Yeah, it is really gusty. It's also blowing a little bit of sand and dust around, so the visibility not terrific along the Front Range this afternoon. But let me show you on the satellite picture. The leading edge of this system just approaching Salt Lake City. This is a system that's going to drop four to eight inches of snow starting on Wednesday in the high country and continuing through Friday. Ahead of it, winds out of the southwest, very gusty due to the pressure gradient, which is increasing low pressure setting up to the north of us, and we're seeing those winds continue, especially south of downtown and east up over the Continental Divide. There have been some gusts to 30 and 40 miles per hour, but it'll be tomorrow when the wind really ramps up. Temperatures today were kind of cool, at least to start. We're at 56 in Denver now and in Greeley, 64 Lamar, 60s up in the high country. And look at the current wind speeds right now. We're seeing just some very blustery conditions to the top of Loveland Pass up toward Laramie, Parker, Aurora Centennial out around Elizabeth. We've had gusts to 40 and 45 miles per hour. And while the winds will ease somewhat tonight, it's not going to be entirely calm. Mid 50s now will drop into the mid 40s after sunset. Speaking of which, sunset is like it's so early now. It's crazy. We're tracking a Thursday storm, which may bring a little bit of snow right here to the front range on Thursday morning, but I'm not used to it getting dark at five o'clock at night yet. Are you guys? It's like getting dark already. It's crazy. Oh, it's and just... you guys, tomorrow morning, full moon, the November full moon at 4.02 a.m. I know you'll both be up exercising or doing. Tom will be. Do. Yeah. So check out the full moon tomorrow morning. Probably on the run back from the run out. Right. <laughs> Unlikely. All right. <laughs> The Thanks, run back on the run. Out. Yeah. We'll talk Bring to you bagels, in a bit. okay. <laughs>